In Canada, we can see aspergillus as a cause of mycotic abortion. Um, this again tends to be a sporadic disease, which occurs six to eight months into pregnancy. It is associated with poor quality feeds, so whether it's consumption of the fungus or breathing in the spores, um, the aspergillus spores reach the placenta hematogenously, and we don't typically see any systemic signs of illness. The animal seems like it's doing fine, and then the abortion occurs. The placenta is thickened with necrotic lesions, and on the abortuses, we can see sort of ringworm-like lesions or plaques associated with fungal growth. In these images here, you can see uh, sections of bovine placenta from animals who aborted. Um, on the left, we have necrotic placentitis, and I think you can appreciate these uh, very necrotic, abnormal-looking cotyledons. On the right, we have a zoomed-in view of just one cotyledon, um, where we have these focal areas of necrosis. In this image here, um, you can see a close-up of uh, an aborted fetus with these round uh, fungal plaques all over the skin, so these ringworm-like lesions. In dogs, we can see several types of infections associated with aspergillus. Nasal aspergillosis is by far the most common and is associated with aspergillus fumigatus. Aspergillus terius and deflectus are more commonly found in systemic disease, although this is a, an infection which would be quite rare. We would need to have an animal who's fairly severely immunosuppressed um, in order to identify this. Clinical signs of nasal aspergillosis include mucopurulent nasal discharge and epistaxis, sneezing, and nasal discomfort. So they're going to be pawing at their nose. Aspergillus fumigatus can produce osteolytic toxins, so we get destruction of the turbinates within the nose, and we can also get erosion of the cribriform plate and invasion of the fungus from the nasal cavity into the brain. Diagnosis of nasal aspergillosis includes a thorough physical exam plus a nasal workup, um, possibly including uh, rhinoscopy and even a CT. On physical exam, one of the things that you're going to be looking for uh, with dogs suspected to have nasal aspergillosis is depigmentation. So you can see the mucosa on the inside of this dog's nose is quite pink as compared to the rest of the nasal epithelium. These are some still shots from a rhinoscopic examination of a dog with nasal aspergillosis. And I think what you can appreciate here are these fungal plaques. So you'll drive in with a scope and actually see uh, the mats of mycelium growing um, in the nose. In this postmortem image, you can see the gross view of nasal aspergillus. Um, so on cut section, uh, the fungal mats are seen on the nasal turbinates, perhaps going back towards the cribriform plate and towards the brain. On the right, what you can see is a right stain of nasal exudate from a dog with nasal aspergillosis. And these abundant fungal elements are really, really uh, notable. This is a, a key part of the diagnosis. Antifungal therapy is critical for these infections, although systemically administered drugs do not have a good success rate. It's around 40 to 60% success. Um, these dogs would be treated most likely with azole antifungals, and we run into issues of hepatic toxicity. Of course, the first step is to debride the fungal plaques and remove as much of that sort of grossly infected tissue as possible. Topical antifungal therapy is really critical. Um, either enoconazole or clotrimazole uh, infusions can be done. A 1% solution can be infused through catheters into the nasal cavity, where it's left to sit for up to an hour. Another, perhaps more successful strategy, is to actually trephinate the sinuses of the dogs, um, so the sinuses on the side where we have the aspergillus infection, fill that sinus with clotrimazole cream, and then close the hole in the bone with bone wax. The idea here is that the clotrimazole slowly makes its way out of the sinus into the nasal cavity and provides longer-term topical antifungal therapy uh, to the nasal aspergillosis. One thing that's critical when doing this topical therapy is to ensure that the crib reform plate is intact. If we have breaches in that bony structure, you're going to get antifungal drugs into the brain, which is definitely not uh, a desirable outcome.
In people, we see Aspergillus most commonly affecting the respiratory system, and the most common species are Fumigatus and Flavus. There's a few key syndromes, um, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, which is similar to asthma. We can have aspergilloma, so sort of a fungal ball um, in people who have this. They'll be coughing, they'll have hemoptysis, so coughing up blood and perhaps shortness of breath. And then we can have invasive aspergillosis. So these are going to be febrile, they'll have chest pain, and other signs depending on where the infection has localized. Aspergillus has an affinity for invading blood vessels. So remember that carotid artery in the guttural pouch. And the same thing is certainly true in people as well. In cases of an aspergilloma, um, this is where we have sort of a fungal ball, this mat of hyphae, which develops most commonly secondary to other conditions, and it occurs most commonly in the lungs. Invasive aspergillosis is an incredibly serious infection. This is something that we associate with severely immunocompromised individuals, such as those people who've received bone marrow transplants, and there's a really high mortality rate. And then finally, swimmer's ear. So this is like an aspergillus otitis externa. Um, it's associated with itching, pain, and scaling of the ear. For sample collection, um, depending on what stage your patient is at, if they're still alive, um, we can collect tissue biopsies, um, perhaps lungs or nodules from the lungs in cases of birds, um, or nasal biopsies or uh, samples of fungal mats collected rhinoscopically. If we have an abortion, fetal abomasal contents and placental tissues can be really useful, milk in cases of mastitis, scrapings, fungal plaques, and of course, as always, do not freeze the sample if you want to culture it. Aspergillus can be identified using direct microscopy. In fact, this is really important. Um, we can use things like KOH preps of tissues, so concentrated potassium hydroxide to degrade host tissues, making those fungal elements more visible. We can culture these organisms on sabor dextrose agar or a variety of other selective and differential media. Histology or cytology is also very important, so looking at biopsy specimens or nasal or endoscopically collected samples. In human diagnostics, there's a quantitative galactomen in ELISA, which is used to monitor response to therapy for people who have invasive aspergillus infections. Galactomannin is a component of the cell wall of aspergillus, and so by looking at how much of this is present in the blood, a physician is able to assess whether the therapeutic strategy is successful or unsuccessful. So decreasing levels of galactomannin in the blood um, are what you want to see. This is not a test that's yet used in veterinary medicine, but it's one that we may want to be aware of as we have a greater and greater immunosuppressed population of particularly companion animals, where we may see more and more invasive aspergillus infections. Aspergillus is really not readily transmitted between individuals. So the risk of transmission, whether it's zoonotic transmission or between species is low. Um, we're much more concerned with acquiring these organisms from the environment. In people, we know that occupational exposure is potentially a risk, um, particularly those individuals working in waste management, so working with compost or large amounts of organic waste. Um, Aspergillus is one of those organisms that degrades plant material, and so we can see large numbers of spores in those environments. When treating these infections, the first question you need to ask yourself is, is this infection systemic or localized? With localized being by far the most common in our companion animals. Azoles are the treatment of choice systemically, either itraconazole or voriconazole. Fluconazole is not active against aspergillus. Um, amphotericin B may be another good option. And in cases where we have disseminated disease with owners who are very, very dedicated and have a lot of resources they can um, apply to treating these infections, caspofungin may be a reasonable adjunctive therapy. Other filamentous fungi, such as mucor or rhizopus species, are intrinsically voriconazole resistant. So this is why getting at least a genus level ID is really important uh, for guiding therapeutic selection. Antifungal susceptibility testing is really not done in veterinary medicine. In human infectious disease, we know that antifungal resistance is on the rise, 
and azole-resistant aspergillus is increasingly problematic. Um, there's two sort of main mechanisms that we think might be responsible for this azole resistance. One is the use of azole fungicides for treating crops. Um, so aspergillus is common in the environment, and when crops are treated with an azole, we expose those environmental organisms to the drug as well, potentially selecting for resistant organisms. On the other side, we have patients who are chronically infected with aspergillus and may receive round after round after round of azole therapy, leading to in vivo resistance development. So not something that we're dealing with yet in veterinary medicine, but certainly something that we should be aware of on the horizon. Just a couple of new terms today, Horner syndrome and cribriform, and then of course, some questions for self-assessment. Mm -hmm.